everyone, Liam here. Welcome to the How to Paint Non-Metal Metallic Swords. This video is part of a series which I'm doing for Patreon based on this vampire that you can see on screen. So I've taken this video out of that series so I can show it off on YouTube. So as always, I hope it's helpful. If you've got any queries, if you've got any questions, leave them in the comments below. If you do want to support me or if you do want to see the rest of this series, how I painted the rest of this model, model and many more videos, Feel free to check out my Patreon in the links below. If you want one-to-one -one tuition, if you want to improve your painting, feel free to, again, check out Patreon. It's got tuition options on there, and I'm also available for commissions. If the video is helpful, please hit that like button, and if you're new to the channel, hit the subscribe, because we do, it does make a huge amount of difference. But here we go. So first of all, this sword, we're trying to keep it incredibly simple. So the colors that I'm using is Vallejo Model Color Black, Vallejo Model Color White, using a small amount of Vallejo model color, dark Prussian blue, and on one point on the blade, I'm using a small touch of Scale 75 Deep Red. So there's only four colors in this, but the majority of what we're gonna paint with is gray. The idea behind this blade as well is I wanna be quite brave with how bright it is. And I also want a very asymmetric result, and I want a lot of randomness to the reflection in it. So you can see the blade is started with a black base coat, this is purely a choice of mine. I quite like starting with a really dark base coat, but it's entirely up to you. It doesn't make any real difference to it. You can see that I've got a gray there. So I've mixed black and white. You can also see it's got a hint of blue to it. So I've added a small amount of blue to it just to give it some color. Reality is, is that blue, that gray, sorry, is pretty close to say GW uh, Dark Reaper uh, as an example. So. I'm at this point, I'm more focused on the left hand side of the blade because that's the one that's going to be more prominent to the front view of this vampire. So the left hand side of the blade, I've base coated entirely with gray. I know we we'll want to go very bright with this. So I'm starting with a fairly uh, consistent base coat, fairly consistent base layer of this, this mid-tone gray. This sword also has like a, a little dip in the center of it. So what that means is, is on the right hand side of that dip, that's also going to receive the same amount of light as the blade. So just to try and explain exactly what I mean, this is the, the shape of the blade. So this would be the left hand. Uh, this side here is the left hand side flat of the blade. This side here is the right hand side flat of the blade. And then in the center, we have like this dip with this sharp angle. So what that means is, is if our light is coming from this direction here, means that this area here is gonna receive the light. So it's gonna be the brighter part of the blade. But actually it also means that this point here is also going to receive a similar amount of light as this first section. So that means that we need to have the bright area here bright area here in both of those um, planes of the blade and then the other side in theory is going to be in shadow if we only had one light source then we would have this actual side of the blade here this would be completely dark uh, but naturally that would be incredibly boring so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna change that a little bit as we go so I'm hoping that's that's clear so you can see at this point Main priority is I'm just trying to get the shape of the blade, the, the the shape of the blade clearly defined. So I've got a nice flat gray color. The the gray isn't too bright. It's very it's it's quite a fair mix between black and white. So it's not too bright. It's not too dark. And you can see exactly what I was just talking about. I'm now picking out that sharp angle on the inside of this recessed blade so you can see exactly what i mean by i'm, I'm making that little that little crease pop now i apologize this is a really small model so i'm trying to keep it on camera as much as i can there are going to be a few bits which are going to be a little bit difficult to see but you're not really going to miss too much all the important stuff you'll see so this is how it starts for me i've put a nice flat base coat. So this paint is probably thinned down to one part water to one part paint. The idea is I don't want to put too many layers of paint like because I don't want to waste my time. So 
The idea is I'm looking for as opaque a paint as possible while still being as fluid as possible so it doesn't leave like it doesn't obscure any of the texture and I'm just trying to find the shape on the blade I'm just trying to define the shape at this point the highlights and the reflections come later so next up I'm going to just place my my brightest reflection on this sword my brightest point on this sword and I knew very early on that I wanted to go really, really bright with this sword. When I was looking at reference pictures for realistic blades, actually there's a huge amount of almost white on them. So I knew I wanted to try that. I didn't want to stick with the, the norm of what we do as miniature painters and just alternate the light and dark. I wanted to go for something a bit more realistic. I haven't succeeded in that completely, but the result I think is quite nice. So you can see like the whole bottom half of this blade I've pretty much painted like almost to white. It's not it's not actually white. It's just a very bright gray that reads as white. So the whole bottom half I've painted this color and the reason why I've done that is because I do want some variation. And as this blade points forward, so it leans forward, my idea is, is that as it gets towards the tipping point at the top, it might receive a little bit less light than the bottom. The reality is I didn't look into it or think about it too much. It was purely an artistic choice. I know to get a shiny surface, we need to have some darker tones. We need to have some darker values. And when I say values, I mean the, the jump between light and dark, irrespective of color. So I knew it had to have some part of the blade darker and the the decision in the end was i thought it'd look nicer if i did the top part of the blade a lot darker and that was the basis of the choice there wasn't i didn't really think too much about the the light the way the light would behave i just thought it all look cool so it was very much a rule of cool choice the next thing to think about as well is with non-metal metallic edge highlights are drastically drastically important they're so important because metallic surfaces do reflect light on their edges like in a really strong way so you need those edge highlights and if you're if you're painting non-metal metallic and you haven't done your edge highlights it's very difficult for it to it's really very difficult for you to start seeing the non-metal metallic result so if you are struggling with a non-met paint scheme painting the edge highlights is what i would say and that will help quite a lot now, the benefit of going really bright with this highlight as well is I know that I can't really go that much brighter. So this blade doesn't look shiny yet. So I decided to, the top half of the blade, make it darker. So I added more black to the mix. And every time it started getting a bit boring, I just put a little bit more blue into this into this gray mix. This was the idea. The blue was just constantly tinting the, the gray that I was using. And I've darkened up that top half of the blade because the thing is is once we go to almost white we know we can't go any brighter so that restricts our choices so if we've gone to almost a white then actually we know to make this look shiny we've either got a problem with the shape of what we're painting uh, the shape of the volumes or we need to go darker so sometimes it's really good to go really dark or really bright because what that does is it limits your choices and makes those decisions a lot simpler and you can see there that I've just I've, I've pretty much just done uh, a quick blend. It's not too, it's not particularly perfect at the moment because the idea is I want to see, uh, I want to see how to make this blade shiny before I go too far with spending ages with nice smooth blends. So the idea is that I'm sketching this in very quickly before I make any hard time investments. You can see on the right hand side of the blade, my idea with this is I wanted to put in some different color and I thought if I put some of this scale 75 deep red into this gray mix then what it might do is it might give me a nice result where it almost looks like we've got a little bit of a, a slight reflection from the actual armor itself. I do like the result. I don't think that has been particularly successful but it was a nice result nonetheless. And the other thing that I did know that I wanted to do, wanted to do was the opposite side of the blade, the right hand side of the blade, I wanted to have the bright area at the top of this blade because that way it would stand out very strongly with the left hand side of the blade which had the shadow at the top. 
And then that way what it does is it creates that contrast of light and dark and that's what will help. And it's, it's really important. So with the right hand side of the blade, it was a choice of necessity. And the idea is, is the right hand side of the blade is lit by a different light source. Because if we've only got one light source that hits the left hand side, then in theory the right hand side is going to be really dark. But that can be incredibly boring, of course. So the idea here is we've got another light source which is hitting the right hand side of the blade and it's hitting more at the top of the blade. And what that means is, is that, that red that you can see at the bottom of the blade, that's never going to be particularly bright. I always want that very dark because that's still going to be my shadow area. So it's almost like a subtle reflection in the shadow of the blade. So next up what I'm thinking about is contrast. So now I'm looking at it going, well it doesn't look shiny, I'm happy with where I'm going to place my light, but we don't have a shiny surface. And the, re the reason for that is, is because we don't have enough contrasting value in our light and dark. Now I will say this, I have no issue saying this, you do not need to go from black to white when painting non-metal metallic. You do not need to go that extreme when you're painting non-metal metallic. It is helpful, you can get some really good results, you do not always need that range of contrast, especially everywhere, and across an entire piece it can actually be quite limiting, and I do go into that in other videos, but it's clear at the moment this right hand side of the blade we don't have a huge range of contrast, it's very much, or contrast in value, because there's lots of different types of contrast that we can use but it's very clear that that gray on that right hand side is all very similar. So first thing that I'm doing is I'm going darker. I'm not using black, I'm using a dark gray mix. Again, I've gone back to that black and white with a little hint of blue. And I'm just pushing the shadows for where I want the darker sections of this sword. Because remember, the darker we make our shadows, the darker we make our shadow areas, the brighter our lights will look or in this case, so the brighter the reflections will look. So remember when I said earlier, if you're trying to see whether your non-metal metallic is really working, you need to have the elements in there to the, that naturally occur. So straight away here, although I can see the result that I'm going for and I'm happy with it, it's still good to really check and make sure so the next thing that i'm going to do is i'm quickly going to paint in some edge highlights with a gray it doesn't really matter as long as it's fairly bright so you can actually see the highlight but the idea here is is the edge highlight is going to frame the sword so it makes it clearly readable we can easily see what it's going to look like at the end but more importantly it's going to make it look more shiny just because that's how metal behaves and you can see the rule that we've got here is generally speaking when we have a dark section we have a light section next to that dark area and vice versa that's the only way this works i'm going to apologize in advance with this last little bit i'm going to try and edge highlight the center of the blade the reality is is this is so small um, and so finicky that i end up getting my fat head in the way I apologize for that but you can still see what i'm doing at least so when it comes to edge highlighting I'm not going to pretend and, and say like this is easy to do because it's not. I can explain the theory of it. The reality is, is you're going to need to practice brush control. What I would say to you when you're trying to do these edge highlights is put your paint on your brush. Don't overload your brush. So you only want paint at the tip or around the end of your brush. Remove the excess from your brush so you don't have a big blob and then what you want to do is pull your brush along a piece of kitchen roll or something like that and twist your bristles as you go. This will restore the point on your brush. And then when you're doing your edge highlight, try to use the side of your brush closer towards the tip. And the reason for that is, is the closer towards the tip of the brush that you are, the smaller the, the, smaller the surface of the brush is going to hit that model, which is going to help you get that really small crisp edge highlight line the other thing is is consistency is incredibly important there is no golden consistency with paint or rather across all paints the the perfect consistency for a paint depends on what you're doing and what paint you're using 
All I can tell you is, is your paint wants to be as opaque as possible because you don't want to have to do loads of edge highlights because it's difficult. And you want your paint to be as fluid as possible because that way you don't get any resistance or inconsistent lines because what can end up happening is you can have lots of little dots and your, your brush can almost end up like scratching the model and it gives you a really nasty line and you don't want that. So in this case, I've used one part water to one part paint because I'm using Vallejo model color paints. I like these paints because they're very opaque. So because they're a brand that I know, I know instinctively how they're gonna behave and how I want to thin them. Every single paint brand, color, and individual part will have its own sweet spot. And one of the biggest skills that you as a miniature painter need to develop is your understanding of managing your paint consistency because your paint consistency will change it will even change depending on the technique you are using so it's not something that you should have a clear recipe for it's something that you should have almost an intimate understanding of so another thing that's a challenge here is the center of the blade at the top these two areas connect into like a little triangle. But the problem is, is you don't have a sharp line. And the issue that arises there is that you can no longer edge highlight in the sense that you, you can no longer really use the side of your brush because the, the sculpt itself doesn't have, doesn't have a sharp edge for you to do that. So what that means is you have to paint the line on yourself. And this is incredibly difficult, but it's why I always say when I'm teaching that painting, being able to paint lines and good brush control is, is one of the most important things you can learn because you will always need to do it. So the only thing that I can, the only advice that I can really offer you at this point when it comes to painting really crisp lines is first of all, control your breathing. So exhale, for me personally, I exhale as I do this brush stroke. And then that settles my hands because my hands shake quite a lot. You are going to see me do this in a minute. The next thing that you want to do is put your paint on a brush and then remove the excess. Twist your brush along a piece of kitchen roll and that will restore the point on your brush. It's also worth noting you need decent brushes. It's the one thing I'm very much a believer in. You do not need to invest in, and buy loads of tools when it comes to miniature painting. But you do need to invest in some decent brushes if you're going to go for a higher quality painting. Um, just because there's always going to be points where you do need to do crisp lines and you're going to need to use the point of your brush. So exhale as you do your brush stroke, that will steady your hands. The other thing is, is you want to do one brush stroke. If you do lots of small little brush strokes, what's going to happen is you're giving yourself more work because every time you do a brush stroke, you've then got to join up the previous stroke and you can see me doing it here. And this is a bad habit that I've fallen into, but I've managed to kind of correct it. But you can see how when I do that brush stroke, I try to do one long one, but I keep going over it. And that's a bad habit. You really want to just do one long sweeping brush stroke, exhale as you do it. And then what will happen is, is hopefully your hands will settle and you want to pull your brush towards your wrist. So when you're doing your brush stroke, your brush is in your hand and then you want to move your hand directly backwards because that will give you the most control for that particular stroke. Now, for me, you, you can see the blade here. For me, I can see that this non-metal metallic is going to work at this point. Potentially, if you're less experienced, you might not be able to, but I can clearly see I'm happy with the shape. I'm happy with the, the reflection areas. Now I need to reinforce it. So our choices here are, do we go brighter or do we go darker? Because I'm happy with the shapes, so that's my volumes. So the only other thing that I can really be missing is, do I have enough contrast? And the reality is that that's, that's no at this point. So my choices are, do I go darker or do I go brighter? And the, rea the, the fact is that I can't go any darker. My shadow, the darker areas on this blade is, are already close to black. So because I've gone so dark, I've limited my choices. So that makes my decision very easy. And I've done that intentionally. So if I've worked with a very dark um, a dark shadow area, I know that if I don't have that shiny re result, 
I just need to go brighter and it will fix that. So the next thing that we're going to do is brighten up our reflection areas. So the left hand side of the blade is a little bit more complicated just because with the left hand side of the blade we have this huge bright area and what will happen is is if we just have that whole bright area the one one value the, the one brightness consistent across the blade going to look incredibly boring and fake so we don't want that so even though that reflection area the bright area on this left hand side of the blade is receiving one one level of light we want to vary the amount of light that we have in it so what i'm going to end up doing is towards the bottom of the blade is going to be the brightest point but towards the middle of the blade i'm also going to have that incredibly bright but i'm going to have an ever so slight variation in the level of brightness on this blade and what this does is it just gives it a little bit of interest and it gives it a little bit of almost believability so what i'll do in a minute i will show you exactly what i mean so i'll take a screenshot of the model as we are painting it like i normally do in the videos and i'll zoom in and i'll show you exactly what i mean but what i'm going to do is you're going to see that i'm going to start brightening this blade back up I'm also normally I don't use a huge amount of white just because I, I tend to find it a little bit unnatural but I'm trying to break my rules in this on this particular video so I am using pure black and I am using pure white normally I would not do it but again if I if I don't push myself or try different things I'm never gonna know any better so the top right hand side of this blade you can see I've just drastically up the light on that it's a little bit messy again because I'm playing with volumes because I'm trying to work out the best result to get that reflection I'm not worrying about the blends yet we can fix the blends later if it's a little bit rough that's not a problem believe it or not smooth transitions are not really that important when it comes to non-metal metallic in fact with some metallic results a smooth transition can actually hold the result back you also see this is what i was talking about with the left hand side of the blade the middle section there i'm starting to brighten up that reflection point and just below it you can see that there's a slight ever so slight variation it's slightly darker and i'm going to make that even more prominent but it's a good example of what i'm talking about it's the perfect example of what i'm talking about sorry the other thing to think about with non-metal metallic is, generally speaking, the smaller your reflection area, the shinier that metal is going to look. And the more the, the more diffused your reflection area, or the wider, the larger your reflection area, the less shiny it looks. So if you've got a, a, a metal that's not particularly shiny or it's quite worn, you do a larger reflection. Uh, but even then that's quite a generalized rule so what i would probably suggest is if you're getting more into more advanced non-metal metallics get a lot of reference materials because this is this is actually a very simple and basic way of doing non-metal metallic i haven't done a huge amount of colored reflections or anything like that
so like I said this is the screen grab from where we're at so the the benefit of doing it this way and not the end of the model is it gives us context to where we're at with it so if I zoom into this blade you can see this left hand side it still obviously looks really rough not at the stage where I'm smoothing it out but this left hand side of the blade we have that large light reflection area but if we look at the actual values of what we have this we have three different uh, almost like three different levels of light or value in this we have this area here which is the brightest point which is one of the bright points sorry this area down here which is a much larger bright point but this area here in the center is slightly darker now it's quite subtle and even at the end it's quite you, you probably wouldn't really notice it until unless you were looking looking for it but the reality is is what we have is three different three different values so the bottom one here is this kind of this this is the color for the bottom of the blade here at the moment then this kind of secondary reflection in the main light is this this up here which you can see there's quite a big difference there actually but this shadow one is that so the difference between the tones in this blade is is very subtle it's not huge it's not a massive jump so you don't always need a huge amount of contrast this is just a it's almost like um, a little imperfection in the reflection and it can especially if you look at the finished piece it can really add to that that shiny that nice shiny result so i'm, I'm hoping that's clear anyway so the last parts to finish on this blade now we need to push the reflection points to that off white i'm not going to go to pure white just because my personal painting process once i finish the model then i'll add my white dots or last little white points that i want to on a model but we're we're going to push those brightest points to that off white and i'm also going to finish cleaning up the edge highlights because the thing is, the edge highlights need a gradient as well. In the darker areas of the blade, potentially we don't want those edge highlights to be as bright as the edge highlights in the brighter part of the blade. And remember, the edge highlights give us the readability. And you can see how, how much of a huge difference they make. I appreciate that you don't need edge highlights on every edge, but with something like this, it can make a huge difference. I'd recommend that you experiment with it. But you can clearly see like the center of that blade has is just has so much definition. It's, it's so simple to understand. And what we forget as miniature painters sometimes, especially when we're painting 28 millimeter miniatures with that whole, there's a lot of the, the strive for realism. Sometimes we, we need to forget about realism. It's imitation of realism. Sometimes we, we need to break the rules to make it look more realistic. And that's something that's really important and you can find that with a lot of models that have been painted sometimes it there it's almost like everything is just meshed together and it's difficult to separate one part from another so and that's and that's why edge highlights are quite important and it's why gw models as an example are incredibly striking and very uh, very clean cut and very clear to read and understand and they look they, why they do look good whether you like that style or not they do look good and that's because we have these very clear separation of the shapes on the models but enough of my rambling you can see the bottom left of the blade is where i've chosen to go the brightest so i've pushed that to my off white and you can see that there and then the top right of the blade that's my brightest point so i'm pushing that to the off white and if you want to you can put a white dot Personally, I very rarely find that it's needed. My, as I said, what I like to do is at the end of the model, I'll go around the model and put a few white dots on key points of the model where I think the light will really bounce. But again, it's your choice. So that's the vampire all done. You can see it on screen. You can see the blade on screen. I haven't shown you how I painted the other side of the blade because it's it's exactly the same the only difference is on the other side i haven't used any red i'm hoping this video is clear as always i've done my best to try and explain things as much as possible if you've got any questions 
If you've got any feedback, please let me know. If there's a way that I can improve these videos, seriously let me know. It's what I'm here for. It's the whole point of this. Hopefully you like the result. Even if you didn't, there should be some things for you to take away. And remember, I say this all the time. My way of painting is not the right way of painting. It's my way. So take away what works for you. Feel free to disagree. Question everything that I am telling you. Because if you question everything I'm telling you, then what's going to happen is you're going to gain a better understanding of it. This is quite a simple non-metal metallic effect. You can go far more complicated with it. But hopefully you like it. And as always, questions, feedback, whatever, leave them in the comments below and I will get back to you. Cheers.